Okay, let's talk about Jake's house. All right. So could you give us a brief history of how the idea for the organization came about? Sure. Um, so we, as mentioned, we had spent a solid decade plus as parents of autistic children. Uh, my wife, I would say about five minutes after Jake was diagnosed, uh, did an incredible job of finding appropriate resources such as therapies, finding out what schools would accept him, which ones weren't. Um, and there were far more that wouldn't accept him that would. Uh, so w the picture I'm trying to paint is that she immediately reset all of the expectations for her um, to suit the boy's needs. I didn't. Um, I took another path, unfortunately, and I was hoping or I was in denial that, you know, maybe the boys were going to snap out of their conditions. So I spent far, far, far too long um, hoping or wishing that something was going to develop and they were going to go away. Uh, my wife, Irene, uh, was very practical in um, applying appropriate supports for the boys. Um, and then when I finally awoke from my slumber, um, you know, and had a chance to look back at what those 10 or 12 years were like, the, the, the combination of understanding how hard it is for parents and, uh, you know, to be quite honest, the frustration of not being able to help our own children further, you you do sometimes uh, reach a limit um, and not so much a limit that they can't learn more tomorrow or the next day, but you start to frame that this is probably uh, the extremes as to where the children are going to develop in terms of their you know abilities to communicate. That my boys will always be defined as at-risk children. Um, neither of them should be uh, left alone for more than five or 10 minutes. Um, so it was a kind of a sobering issue and I had a deep regret for the way I had ignored the prior five or six years. I felt guilt that I had somewhat abandoned my wife in her, um, not, not physically, I didn't go anywhere, but just that mentally I, I wasn't as supportive as I probably should have been. So then we, you know, of course, uh, a number of my friends had, had, and had some successes and, said, well, then let's start to tackle this and let's try to do this. So the very first event we ever had as a charity was our holiday party. And um, I, I like to be sensitive about this because it, it, it arose out of a, a bit of a negative uh, circumstance. Not that, you know, it's ill intended, but one year we were invited to a family Christmas party, 20 or so nieces and nephews running around waiting for Santa Claus to come. And of course, my boys who are quite young at that point, don't understand the concept of Santa Claus. They they're just they're they are very hard to control. Well, lo and behold, next Christmas, no invitation to that party. So to every parent's story, this is when the isolation begins. So my wife uh, said um, I had mentioned to her that I thought starting a charity and raising money to help support different autism causes was a good thing. And she's like, well, can we throw a holiday party as part of the charity? And I'm like, sure. So we funded our first, I think my wife and I funded the first five or six or seven holiday parties um, until they really started to get really big, then we needed help. Uh, but the, the construct of the first holiday party was uh, our two boys, well, our three boys, but our two autistic boys, uh, and 21 other children that had autism and their brothers and sisters and their moms and dads. Uh, we, we knew some local counselors, uh, a really, really nice man had just retired as the chief of police in Toronto, his name is David Boothby. So the chief uh, was our first, uh, he was actually our second chairman, uh, but as our as chairman, he was our Santa Claus for three years. And the premise <laughs> of the party was really simple. My wife would bring in, we rented a local hall, uh, we built a stage, uh, my wife called each of the 21 uh, moms and dads and said, you know, can we get something small? And so she did. And, um, you know, we brought in jumping castles and balloons and the key to everything we do is volunteers. So I promise you, if we had 100 people there, we probably had 50 or 60 volunteers there. And that was the key. So mm -hmm. the party went off. There were some things we didn't do so right, some things we did well, and then we corrected it. So the next year, just on an email list, um, 23 children became 51 children and about 200 people. My wife still, and the phone number to Jake's house um, here in Canada, it's 416 24 7 Jake, 24 7 5253. And that phone used to go right into our house. 
So when the parents wanted, long before emails became you know very familiar and common, my wife would pick up the phone. Hi, Jake's house. Oh, hi, I'm I'm Rachel, and I have a son. I'm like, great. Now you have a son who has autism. Does he have any other? Oh, yes, but they don't have. That's okay. How old is your son's sister? And she's six. So the rule became. Everybody with autism, so we run now from two years old to 72 years old at our last party, um, and all brothers and sisters under 12 get presents, because how do you tell an eight-year-old typical child, you're going to a party, but your brother or sister got a present, but you don't. So last year at our Toronto party, we had 700 uh, individuals and children. Yeah. So it went, uh, 21, wow. 51, 109, 200, three. Last year we had over 700 individuals with autism, over 2000 people. And as tradition is, and I don't know how she does this. My wife still goes out and buys, she has volunteers help her buy all the presents and she wraps all the presents. So oh. <laughs> it's crazy. So, and then we did a similar party. The capital of Canada is a city called Ottawa. And we did a second party, slightly smaller, it was about 500 people. But I think my wife wrapped about 1,200 gifts and she signs them all. And at the event, she gives them all out personally. Um, But just to show you how the volunteers grew, from that first volunteer party of about 50, we had well over 300 volunteers at our Toronto party for the kids. So the holiday party and the just trying to build a community and get to know each other is how we started. And then where we went from them is a program we've now developed that is supported by our province, which we call our Legends Mentoring Program. And it was essentially, we saw the benefit of having all the volunteers help a parent just check their coat or tell a parent, I'll watch Jake for the next 15 minutes. You go have a slice of pizza and just breathe for 20 minutes. And I'm right over here and I've got it. It was incredibly helpful. So my wife said, if we're going to do it once a year, let's do it once a week. So we started putting together a program. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, my wife doesn't say a lot, but when she talks, we're smart enough to all listen. So, and we, 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 speak, so we have a whole yeah. team of 18 people that put all of her ideas into play. And when we start going a little bit too far left or too far right, she just course corrects us. And um, so the Legends of Mentoring program was the next program. It was very successful in getting more volunteers. So now 300 became 3,000 volunteers. And and how do we connect them in various regions? And how do we create programming? Of course, since covid we've turned all those programs online. So we do cooking courses online. We do uh, uh, athletics online with all of our various partners. We've started a dance program online, just anything to keep kids active and and interaction. Each of them has a volunteer presence. So um, again, from the holiday parties where we kind of meet you for the first time to our mentoring program, uh, very much mirroring my sons as they grew, my wife's like, you have to start an employment program. So I'm very happy and very proud. I just found out today a few more of our, our, our Jake's House family members were taken on by companies. Corporate Canada has been fantastic. Um, you know, we have a, a company that's a global organization called Special Asterna. Uh, they were started in Europe. The uh, Canadian CEO and I met three or four years ago. And I said, listen, we'll try to support everything we can do to you know, get meaningful employment. Because again, the autism spectrum is very wide. So, yes, my son Jake is very limited in what he can do, but yet five days a week, he finds meaningful work in a school. He shreds paper. He can index books because even though he can't talk, he has the ability to index books in a library. Um, They they continue to find more uses, more uses as he becomes more of that community. Um, So employment was the... um, the next kind of pillar. So and yeah, could I just ask a little bit about that? Sure. So how does that work exactly? Are you training the individuals with autism with some specific skills? And then how do you connect with the companies? Do they reach out to you or yeah, what's that process like? That's where, so the success of our charity and the success of anything in this world is partnerships. So the partner that we have in our employment program is that company Special Asterna. So the reason we kind of reached out to them is because I would get emails every once in a while would say, Royal Bank of Canada looking to hire, um, we're looking for candidates. So and then, you know, a month later, I would get, uh, you know, Google is looking to hire. And I'm like, wow, these are big companies. And it's specifically just for those with autism. So Mm -hmm. we connected. And they, again, they are a, they have the Canadian franchise of a global initiative and it's very similar. The family that started um, Special Asterna, I think it's in Denmark and I really want to be accurate. So I'd, I'd hate to be wrong on that, but I believe it's a family in Denmark that started it. Their goal was to place 
a million individuals on the spectrums around the world. And then they started franchising the idea out. Uh, the gentleman, Alan Chris, is the CEO of Canada, and we deal with Alan and his amazing team. So we've built a team that supports their team. So it. if, if it's funding or anything we can contribute with, but essentially they're the ones who find the, um, the companies that are looking. And, it's, and there is a, to your point about culture shifts, there is a strong uh, push uh, to be inclusive in hiring. Uh, to hire individuals all across neurodiverse uh, issues, not just autism, but in other uh, fields as well. So it, it's an inviting environment. Even today in the world of COVID, we've, I'm happy to find out we just we made placements today. So which, you know, in a world where jobs are being lost, I said maybe there's opportunities. People rehire, they might get a chance to, you know, incorporate others uh, with special needs. So it's the partnership where we would not profess to have the specialties that Specialist Erna has in that particular field. And we do it in everything else. We have another incredible housing partner, but I'll, I'll save that till we get to there. Okay. Just to follow up on the, the volunteer program. Sure. So could you break down how that works? Like, is it a, one volunteer that's assigned to a family and are they only working together for that one particular event or yeah, what's that process? So I don't want to take us too far into the details, but each event has, has a time frame. So in other words, originally we were trying to follow a big brothers, big sisters model where commitments are quite substantial. They're for one year. So what we did is we, we experimented with that for a while and then we found possibly more success in shortening the programs. So we run 10 to 12 week programs in the various fields that I talked to you about. Uh, and, and then once they're finished, they restart. So it's a little easier to engage. And what, and you're absolutely correct. Prior to COVID, if there were 15, you know, individuals showing up for a painting class, they would be assigned to 15 volunteers and the volunteers would show up. They would be supportive. Now online, um, we tend to use less volunteers because quite frankly, it's just, it's just, it, you don't quite need as many volunteers, but, Looking ahead a little bit and knowing that COVID will be something of the past, um, April 2nd of this year, 2021, we're looking to um, start a very, very aggressive volunteer campaign. Um, and we found, in my opinion, the best partner for the charity that we could ever find in an organization called U-Sports. And what U-Sports is, is it's the collection of 53 or 56, the number escapes me, uh, 53 or 56 universities right across Canada. And Canada is basically divided into four parts. There's the East, the West, the Middle, and kind of Quebec and Ontario. Each kind of division has a chapter lead. Um, and there's 1 million students if you go over the collective enrollment. So we are going to create a campaign and marketing to engage in different levels of fashion because it's not practical. We don't have a million individuals with autism. Um, but we are going to try to engage as many of those students as we can uh, in a campaign that you know has them reaching out to those with autism in their local communities. So we always partner with the local university in Toronto. The University of Toronto comes on board. You start talking to them and all your autism support goes through there. Uh, it's similar to other places around the country. So the volunteer core is the key. It's the key because it's the unpaid labor staff if we had to pay 3,000 volunteers, we could never afford it. Um, you know, now keeping them motivated is, is, um, is, is a challenge. Keeping them focused, you know, try to give them something that they can truly make a difference is something that we spend an awful lot of time on. Uh, but we're finding that the university um, level individual um, is very, very receptive to giving of themselves. Um, we're very, very uh, optimistic. And, and again, Rachel, not to make it personal, um, but you know, my sons, Jake and Jonathan, other than their autism will probably live very long and otherwise healthy lives. It's the generation behind me that's going to be taking care of our children. So our entire staff here is very relatively young. Uh, our leader is very young. Um, but, uh, she's extremely passionate, um, you know, incredibly qualified, uh, and, and motivates people even younger than her to help. So this is where people like myself, my wife, are, are so encouraged, um, you know, because the first question you have when the boys are two, four, and six is, if we're dead, you know, James is seven or eight years old at that time, my mom is in her late 70s at that time, who's going to take care of our kids? It's, it's, you know, it's a very, it's a chilling question that a lot of parents go through. 
So if we can somehow light the fire across Canada, where you've got a million brothers and sisters looking out for their, you know, their autistic friends, uh, even if just their education is just, if we can just educate them just that little bit more, so they're not afraid if they see somebody at the gas station, if you know what I mean. So it, the volunteers are the lifeblood of our entire charity. There's no mm-hmm. question about it. So your sons live with you, right? Yeah, the two that have autism. Two youngest. Live with okay, yeah. so maybe this is a good segue to talk about the housing initiative that you guys have too. Okay. What services are available for adults in Canada as far as like group homes or residential facilities? So in our research, we've always had the mind that because we've been very fortunate uh, to have gathered the interest of a lot of people, a lot of core, and we, we say this, we're incredibly humble and grateful that we have it. So we don't say it as a boast. We say it as, thank God they're there. We've always approached everything we've done as go find the leader in this case, housing, and let's put all of our support behind that group. And so we, we, do, we do push far and wide before we make an initiative, not to replicate something, because there would be no sense in replicating. Uh, you know, it just, it just wouldn't make sense. So if there was somebody out there, and the only answer I can give you is there are uh, organizations that have built smaller units, four to six, you know, residences uh, take a home and retrofit it for four to six individuals and maybe have, you know, 15 or 20 of those. Um, There are a couple of organizations that have built slightly larger, um, you know, kind of 50 units, something that would look more like a traditional nursing home or something. There wasn't anybody that put the proposal to the government that we did. We put, they're currently Jake's house. And again, our housing partner is an incredibly um, generous group of individuals. Um, Greg Zare and David Marshall uh, have combined in their company, Marshall Zare, and they have a fantastic team. And the only reason Jake's House was able to acquire its first residence, which is a 54-unit building, which we are tailoring solely towards the autism community. I just, I just want to say this one caveat is this was a retirement home. So in this particular building, um, there, there are still a number of retirees that exist in the home. It's always going to be their home as long as they want. Um, that particular site, we can double from 54 units to a, roughly 110. And what we will start doing is moving in perhaps a single mom who's in her 60s with a 30-year-old autistic son. There are individuals uh, that are uh, you know, mildly affected that can live on their own but need some support. We will have single unit suites, but this is not a building that you would be moving on. We call them Jake's House Community Residences. You will not be moving in there and you get your key and then it's like, good luck. It's monitored 24-7. There are nurses. There are, you know, we have, it's not like you're walking into a a condo where you have the, you know, the concierge at the front door. This is almost like, and I want to use my words carefully because we're trying not to be identified in one thing, but this is almost like you're walking into a a hospital grade support system, but it doesn't feel like that. It feels like your home. So we have four properties uh, right across the, uh, uh, in, in, you know, in a, in a relatively confined space in terms of the country. Our province is a big province. Um, and we've given a proposal to our government for 15 properties. And again, does Jake's house have the expertise or the skill set to find those properties? No. Does Jake's house have the skill set to fund those properties? No. Um, so this is why when we find an organization like Marshall Zare and Greg and David and Cecil and Murray and their entire team and how they are literally trying to change the culture in this country, they're saying that there's 30,000 individuals on wait list for home here. I don't know if that's a big number. I don't know if that's a small number, but that's a lot of people. So, you know, and, and it's not going to work respectfully four or six at a time. Now, you know, so we've always want to be careful that the buildings that we create have a diverse, there has to be diversity in it. We can't put, you know, you wouldn't want 99 other Rachels or 99 other Davids in one building. It would drive everybody crazy if we all looked alike and we're all so, <laughs> as with everything else within the culture of community, as nice as you are, Rachel, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't be against 99 <laughs> other Rachels, but I think you get my point. Um, yeah. you, you, you need to have a diversity within your own community. And because we have multiple buildings, 
all of the fundamental features like the mentoring program and the employment can be driven out of the buildings. So we tried to be as efficient as possible with our model that don't create something that's going to create two lanes. We wanted to have everything housed within one. Uh, and in this particular case, it works out tremendously well. And whenever we get lost or confused, uh, we just do whatever Irene tells us to do. So because she tends <laughs> to figure out why, why we're making mistakes. And it always comes back to Rachel just because everybody's like, what are we going to do? What are we? What? There was like so much discussion. She slowed everybody down. She said, can I tell you what they want? They want a home. She goes, just mm-hmm. build them a home. And as simple as that sounds, that's what we did. So because everybody was trying to, should we make all circles, no squares, no left angles? She's like, you guys are overthinking this. She goes, just give them a home where they feel welcomed and safe. And that's it. Like 30 seconds. And we're like, why didn't we figure this out? So a bunch of architects and everybody else can go back to the buildings. And uh, we're very excited about that. And again, um, and I say this openly, uh, we don't want to be the leader in housing. We want to provide really good communities. But we could use 10 more Jake's houses out there because a lot of people need help. So, you know, we're, we're inviting more people to try to, you know, and then we'll give them the blueprints. We'll give you the plans. We're not here to, uh, we're here to help. So as long as your effort is honest, we'll back you as much as we back our own. Because we're all trying to help the same families, you know. And, and mm-hmm. many of the organizations realize that. Some, unfortunately, don't uh, because everybody has differing views. So, so we don't comment on any other organization's philosophies or theories. We just kind of stick to what we do. Mm-hmm. But this is such an Im- important project because – you know, home obviously is where people feel safe and comfortable and you want to start from there so that they can then, you know, develop more independence and more autonomy, more agency to just live their lives to the best quality that they can. I I couldn't tell you honestly what my son Jake thinks. Uh, I look at him every day. He's a puzzle. And, um, but the sense I get is like all of us, he likes to be grounded. There is something that is his foundation. And then once the foundation is set, he works from there. If you remove the foundation, I find, at least with our two boys, I'm I'm by no means an autism expert. Um, With our two boys, and this is why my wife is the hero, for 29 years, she has made sure that their lives are stable. I can count on less than, you know, one hand, the days that my wife wasn't there for the boys. And and it sounds like, well, okay, well, that just just give them meals and just do this. You do that 29 years in a row. It's like, I, I don't know how many, it's like 11,000 days without a day off. And their foundation is her stability. This is the, this is what we're trying to emulate in the homes. So my mm-hmm. wife has, has illustrated that the different times of the day, that the home must show that we're in morning, we're in afternoon, we're in evening. It's important that the calculation of time or some measurement of reference, they seem like small things, right? To you and I, maybe we're doing them subconsciously, like maybe you're looking at your clock going, we've been on the phone for 49 minutes and you know we're always measuring against something else. It's the same from all we can understand with our boys. They do have a North Star and whatever the North Star is, it's the foundation. So, um, and then everything else seems to be built from there. You move the North Star, you call supper, Instead of dinner, you know, my son Jonathan is all the way. I'm like, come get your supper. He goes, it's called dinner. Okay. <laughs> so if it's dinner and it's not supper, you know, but what do I know? So, um, so yeah, so, so the home is, the home has to be the beacon of your foundation. First of all, you're safe um, without feeling like you're in a prison and you can do that. You, you don't have to smother your children, um, you know, but to, to keep their security is top notch. Just a very, very simple example. Um, we do have hot summers here in Toronto, despite what might, some people might think of Canada. Uh, and putting a pool in the backyard is everybody's dream. Um, it's something that we're still to this day. We feel like we can communicate to Jake that you know going into that pool without mom or dad is not good. But we're still not 100% sure and we're still slightly afraid that if we put that pool in there, God forbid one day, you know, uh, we might not be there and might find him in it. So, it's just, it's the, the, you know, but again, every parent worries about their child forever and a day. We're no different. We just worry about different things. So that's the way I yeah. would say. Yeah. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. 
Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comments section. Click here to watch this interview in its entirety. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.